You're welcome back. Now, we're still discussing the Nigerian economy and COVID-19. Wale, Wale Ajiboye is a social entrepreneur with over 19 years' experience in enterprise development, not-for-profit management, and social innovation. He is a passionate um, entrepreneur, and he's passionate about entrepreneurship and has immersed himself in helping entrepreneurs develop and discover their creative genius, innovate, and think globally. Wale currently works as an associate director with Acumen West Africa, where he oversees the implementation of leadership, of the leadership work and support the business development drive to implement the global strategy in West Africa. Now, Wale has worked on a number of um, seminal enterprise development projects, including Goldman Sachs, 10,000 Women Scholarship, and Shiva Regal. Um, the Venture Fund and HP Life Project in Nigeria. Now remember you can join the conversation, tweet at us at Plus TV Africa or at We Show Africa One with the hashtag Ways or send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 8038 Now thanks for joining us, Wale. He's joined us via Skype. Wale, are you there? Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much for inviting me. All right. Me. We've been having quite an interesting conversation with Professor Patitomi. Um, would you like to start yeah. from, um, like, putting a few words on <laughs> from what, 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 what yeah. uh, Professor has said? Uh, Prof is just helping us to see our bubble that Nigeria has been living in. Um, I recall when I first started my career, it was the first, my, my first interview, and I was being asked, uh, what, do, what, does, what do we need as a country to diversify the economy? Um, and today we're still talking about that. And it just feels like Nigeria is just in a serious bubble. And sometimes I make jokes with people like that. Nigeria is living in a lucky bubble where you think that what you see lucky is the reality of the country. And I think this is another opportunity for us to see that we are not moving forward. And how do we get out of this bubble to solve the biggest challenges that we're seeing? Because it's not something new. It's not that we lack the idea. It's not that we lack the like the energy and the and the and the resources resources to do the challenge. Yeah, so we do, we do have the will to push forward, forward, forward. I think that's what has been just. Okay, I think we're having a bit of network issues, but if you can hear me, so what do you think? Because Prof was saying that, I mean, we are not doing our job as millennials. We're not doing our job. So <laughs> what, what would you say about that? How, how are you seeing us you know, rising up to helping this economy grow? I think one of the things that's very confusing about Nigeria is that when you you put people in the if you see people in the country and the amount of work they're doing, uh, uh, you say oh they are not working really hard and there's some people are working really hard. But these guys move to Ghana, they move to Sierra Leone, they move to Liberia, they live to America, and boom they are doing stuff. So I don't think we have a problem in terms of energy. We don't have a problem in terms of talent. I think there's a problem. I think in terms of and Prof actually hit on it talking about the value system what we have created. I think to be fair to Nigerians, to be fair to the millennials. I think people have the capacity and they have intention, but we've not seen the right models. We've not seen the right examples. We're not seeing the leadership of this country showing us and across a level. And it's so easy to point to that, point fingers at the government and say it's the government. But when we see the amount of fraud and the amount of things that we also see in private sector, then we're confused. <clears throat> so the reality is that the, the millennial, yes, we do have uh, a deficit in terms of education, but that's a lot more that has to do with the system and the structure that we've created. There is an opportunity for us right now, and the young people are really ready. But are we getting enough role models? Everybody wants to hammer in Nigeria. Everybody wants to see, I want to make money. But the point is, how do we intentionally find ways and build a system to educate people, to support them, and show them the right examples? Because at the moment, we're still in that bubble. Okay, so uh, apparently there are um, young people who are working hard and trying to think outside the box and create things. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs would say that they put in all the hard work and things are not working out. And we know that in the same economy, some other entrepreneurs have become successful. So is the question, is, what exactly is the problem? Is it that we don't work hard enough or that we're just, um, we don't have enough strategy? I mean, I know the government has a part to play, right? But that aside, what else is the challenge we're facing for millennial entrepreneurs? Okay, so if you just go around a little bit and you just check out what the Chinese and the Indian community, what they've done in Nigeria, you see clearly there's a, there's a clear difference. One is that they believe in the power of collaboration. One of the things that you see around, particularly if you go around, so if you walk around certain schools, you see lots of cars 
parked waiting for kids to finish school, right? So you see a lot of cars. Sometimes you see G-Wagon, you see all kinds of cars there. Those are wasted assets. One of the things that we keep doing fundamentally that is different from what these guys do is to un understand asset utilization. A lot of young people want to just say, the next thing I get five million naira, I want to get a house in Lekki, I want to stay at my office in this, I want to buy cars, and guess, you, guess what, guess what? what they've not even raised enough money to expand the business they're already getting a lot of spending money on assets so if you look at typical behavior of the chinese or the indians they work together they collaborate together together they don't, they don't big offices they even share cars in Nigeria belongs to us because we have one person who has a car somebody has a generator so we're not sharing assets so by the time they look at the parameters of the business, you look at the of the business, you find out that these guys are not even profitable. And people confuse something in Nigeria. Access is considered a strategy. So you think because you have, oh, I have an uncle, you forget the fact that you have an uncle in CBN or you have an uncle at the bank, that's why you're getting that job. And so most people, where you want to even learn from or you want to find to found to mentor you on the examples we can't learn anything from them so i think part of what we have to start thinking about them how do we begin to understand that the fundamentals of business is the same how do you reduce your cost of operation Absolutely. how do you find a way to collaborate how do you withhold that sense that you need to enjoy now and then build intentionally because if you think for the long run in the long run what do you want to build you have to think about that first as against oh you know what now that i'm making so much more my clients are in lucky so i need to move to lucky that is one of the challenges that we're seeing and that's what's affecting a lot of businesses here wow that was really Brilliant. powerful thank yes. you so much Wale Ajiboy. we would have to let you go we are bringing you to the thank studio. you so don't much. worry thank you so much for joining us we just uh, wanted to hear all right. your two thank cents you. on this all right. All right. and prof i think wally just helped me to cap the point i was trying to make you know because it is okay for you to wake up and start shouting, oh, the Chinese are taking over the this. I read a report written by Arbiters, and it was quite instructive how the Lebanese, the Indians, how they transact business. Now, first of all, they would go and patronize themselves. They would make sure their overheads are low. You know, they, they patronize their own. So how can we start to, to um, incorporate that in the Nigerian um, people? You see, we are not stupid. Nigerians are very clever. These young people that we're talking about, I interact with many of them, they're very smart and all of that. But we are victims of a culture of a rent economy. They've come out of a rent system. They were taken to school in G-Wagons, as you were saying, mm -hmm. and they think that the only thing that matters is a fancy car. So they look for all kinds of ways to rationalize it. The first, oh, you see, uh, when I go anywhere and I don't show up in a kind of nice car, the gate man won't even let me in. So capital, I could have gone into the business. It, puts into a G wagon mm. and the business is drained of capital and he cannot go any further. Now, the same young Nigerians, when they step out of Nigeria, will function differently. So it's not in their DNA to behave foolishly. It's the culture, it's the environment. So we need to shut down this environment. We need to prevent, and, and politics is the biggest problem, really. Mm -hmm. When you see some illiterate who calls himself a, whatever political title he gives himself, running around in all kinds of things. People say, look, what's the incentive for me to behave this way? Look at that guy. What? So the whole system de-incentivizes production. This is a system of rent. As he was saying, oh, my uncle is a senator. Can he help me get that contract? So I get that contract. I take a rent. Yeah. I'm not creating value. Absolutely. But we assume that that rent is value. And we live in this bubble of look at the business we are building. How many people have built? Okay. We are having a lot of questions. A lot of questions. So what is the way forward? What strength can we lean on now to make this progress? And someone says, okay, what states in the country can survive without federal support? That's what the person is asking. And what must, must, what must they do to truly gain financial independence? Let's start with that. You know, in the 60s, the reverse was the direction. The, Subnational government generated the revenues and in certain areas transmitted a portion to the federal government. Even crude oil that we're talking about now, the region that produced crude oil was the eastern region. They'll collect the revenue, then they'll send 50% to the center. The day the center collects everything and hands out prebends, you know, to the, uh, that's why it's called prebendalism. You know, like the way the vicar gives prebends to assistant. Back. So people go, hey, I've come to collect FAC account, let me get my own. So the subnational governments are mostly not prepared 
to create value and have become dependencies. I'll give you a very small example. In the American Midwest, there is a, something called TIFA funds. You know, uh, <clears throat> TIFA is tax um, finance authority, tax incentive finance authority, TIFA. What does that mean? It means that a local government, I'm not talking about state, a local government is running around looking to attract people with new ideas to come and create a, a hub and investment in their area. And local government is willing to give you tax incentives, finance authority. They're willing to give you an incentive. They will calculate, look, if this thing locates here, maybe it's a mall. Because this mall is coming here, these kinds of businesses will come around here. Now, because of this mall, 20 years from now, the taxes that will generate in this area will be up to $30 million. That local government will give you tax guarantees, will even give you cash of two, three million dollars to locate that mall in that place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> local government in Nigeria doesn't even think in those kinds of ways. It's how to There's go no and competition. Be people for... you, you, you know, so that's where we began to fail. When the structure of government, when the military then concentrated everything at the center and hands out these prebends, and local governments forgot that they were. Let me give you one incredible example. In the 60s, um, local governments did not have any place in fiscal transfers, sharing money. It's two uh, partners were federal and states, states were the subnationals. States can, could create any number of local governments they wanted just for administrative convenience. In the South, there were twice as many local governments as there were in the North. In 1975-76, the Obasanjo administration changed things. Uh, they looked at Brazil, looked at Eastern Europe, brought a new three tiers of government will now participate in fiscal transfers. About 29% of revenues accruing to the pool, the Sibiru Pool Fund, which is the uh, so-called FAC account, would go to local government. Now, people who had influence began to immediately create local governments of their villages. Everybody's village became a local government. Who are powerful? You were colonel in the army. You could influence general who, who. Suddenly, we had 774 local governments. About 500 of them were in the north of Nigeria. But guess what has happened? The north has become progressively poorer because it's been getting a lot of... Handouts. Yeah. Mm. That's called the lottery effect. Wow. Economists call it, you know, have you seen a, 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 a person who won the lottery, poor yes. person, 10 oh, years later? Yes poorer than they were when they won the lottery. This is clear. <laughs> now, we have many questions. Manufacturing is majorly managed and run by uh, largely foreign-owned foreign companies in Nigeria. How is it that Lebanese and Indians do better in this sector as little um, was major water bottle, as little as major water um, bottling company? Now, that's from Sylvia. Fred says, we are sitting down, uh, staring down the barrel of a recession. What can we do to manage it? Louis says, Professor Pat, have have been in governance in the corridor of power. I think his age um, band and above ha has failed us. That's from Lewis. Ayo says, we need to deliberate about driving a Nigerian agenda and breaking mm -hmm. ethnic barriers. Then Emeka mm -hmm. says, the Igbos um, drive a wonderful system of apprenticeship. We need to scale that in Nigeria and drive the spirit. Um, changing le learning ways, that's from ways. Someone says, um, Ali, you say, someone has 100 million um, he would rather build a hotel than, I think that's just um, collaborating the story. So someone is accusing you that you have failed us, your generation no, and he, above. No, no, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm, I, so I was rephrasing, your generation and above has failed us. So I don't want to even go back to what, what happened or what did not happen. You see, you see, what of, can mm, we do? Yeah, part of the problem is that we are not having a rational public conversation in Nigeria. That's the point I keep making. Yeah. So you, you throw out an, it, something like that, mm. your generation has failed us. So it becomes... A us debate, yeah. versus them. You don't even begin to then find out what kinds of problems, what went wrong. You talked about the um, Lebanese and yes. who running manufacturing. And, uh, there is something um, that I call the emigrant economistic and ethic uh, from my work in Southeast Asia. You find that in most of Southeast Asia, a very small minority Chinese population dominates the economy. 2% in Indonesia dominates the economy. In Malaysia, I don't know whether 19% or whatever. And why is this so? I wrote years ago that migrants, when they come into a place, 
are, they are usually denied access to politics because the locals are too involved in politics, are distracted by politics. There's only one thing they focus on. The only thing they can do to get ahead, business. Mm -hmm. So they usually do it very well. Why were the black Americans there for generations and then the Vietnamese boat people arrived when I was living in the US in the late 1970s and boom, I was trying to explain, you know, this, this Max Weber wrote about the Protestant ethic, yeah. explanation, you know. It's not Protestant ethic, nothing. It's the emigrant economistic ethic. They are completely focused on nothing but making money because they can't go into politics. They can't. In Nigeria, we are too distracted by all these funny things in politics. It is the, that, and we've not got the right kind of people in politics. So that place is failing us. The biggest risk of doing business in Nigeria is government. Policies, yeah. Government. The biggest risk in Nigeria is not going very far. So how can we organize to overcome these impediments? That's what we should be talking about. And if we could all rationally discuss, we might be able to find a few things we can do. But this business of throwing epithets, them, us, it's really because people are not educated. Stop, yes. They don't have enough capacity to think through problems. So they just solve it. I'll quickly say, throw it's the blame. You, you. It's you. actually a brilliant book about that. Uh, this chap called Joshua Green at Harvard. Uh, it's titled Moral Tribes. Okay. This is the case of, you know, we versus them. Thank uh, you. you know. okay. I think we have run out of time. <laughs> I do I'm want so sorry, okay. Sanzi. Right. We'll take your question probably after the show. <laughs> because we really ran out of time. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. Professor Pat, you have to promise our viewers that you come back. Mm. Please. <laughs> He's not answering because he doesn't want you to attack them. But we need to, we need to solve this problem. And we know that we, there's a lot more that can be said and a lot more that can be done as well. Mm. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now, you can watch a repeat broadcast of this episode at 6 a.m. tomorrow and 3 p.m tomorrow. Now, it's been a very insightful conversation, and please keep all the conversations going on all our social media platforms as we continue to hear what you're saying. Now, in case you missed today's quote, here it is again. Every decade or so, dark clouds will fill the economic skies, and they will bring briefly rain they will briefly rain gold. When the downpour of that sort occur, it's imperative that we rush outdoors carrying wash tubs and not teaspoons. Do you agree with that? Um, Warren Buffett is talking in one context. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's all we can take. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>